Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at the application of remote viewing or clairvoyance in criminology or law enforcement. With me is Stephen Schwartz, who is the author of The Secret Vaults of Time, The Alexandria Project, Opening to the Infinite, and The Eight Laws of Change, How to Become an Agent for Personal and Social Transformation. Stephen also produced a network television program on psychic detectives, and uh, he is a, one of the founders of the International Remote Viewing Association, has conducted numerous experiments and applied psi projects in parapsychology, including those involving criminology. Welcome, Stephen. One of the honest skeptics of parapsychology, our late friend Marcello Truzzi, mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Blue Sense, in which he looked at the application of criminology in law enforcement. And uh, I thought it was a good book, but I was surprised that he omitted many of the uh, very successful cases that you and I are both <laughs> aware of. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Marcello, his career was based on being a skeptic, so of course, that's what often happens. That's one of the things about uh, uh, skepticism. We talk about that mm -hmm. another time, but but um, the use of of remote viewing in uh, parapsychology, or the, let, let, no, let's reframe it: the use of non-local perception in the solution of criminological problems dates back. Uh, to the 1500s. Mm -hmm. Indeed, one of the very first uh, examples that has that is recorded and that led to the first scientific discovery, uh, a first scientific examination of non-local perception, involved a peasant, a f kind of uber peasant, uh, uh, named Jacques Aymar, A Y M A R, in France. There was a merchant who was murdered and his wife, they were killed with a cleaver, and uh, which was not the usual thing that happened at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they brought in, they couldn't solve the problem, and it was making the community very upset because they couldn't identify the perpetrator. So they brought in uh, this guy, Aymer. Uh, who was a dowser, as I he recall. He was a dowser. He was, yes, he was a kind of high-level peasant. Uh, they describe him as an uber-peasant. Uh, anyway, they brought him in and he very quickly said there were three people that had committed this crime um, and that they had fled. He then led them to the town of Beaucaire, which was about a hundred miles away, and they had just arrested a bunch of people in a theft, and they lined up 13 men that they had just arrested, and uh, Aymer picked one of them out and said, that's one of the murderers of the three murderers, mm -hmm. and the man confessed, and the other two murderers uh, had fled to Grenoble and crossed the, the border so they couldn't be arrested, mm. but it made him a national hero. And that really is the, that, that's one of the oldest recorded remote viewings. I consider dowsing a form of non-local perception. Mm -hmm. And um, it resulted in the first scientific commission to, could this possibly be true? Became a huge deal in France at the time. But, so there has been a continuing usage of non-local perception in criminology for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. It became. It began to become more systematized um, in the in the sort of mid twentieth century. There are remote viewers who specialize in it. Yes, Noreen Rainier, for instance, <laughs> is one who comes immediately to mind. Noreen Rainier was 
uh, does uh, as a specialty activity. Uh, she works with police departments around the world, around the world, mm -hmm. but around the United States particularly. And she was attacked by skeptics, and the viciously, FBI, viciously <laughs> yes. attacked. Yes, yeah. and the FBI sent down a special agent to testify on her behalf and, mm -hmm. to, and to go on record. Uh, I myself got interested in this. Um, we were doing, of course, the archaeological yeah. work we've been discussing. I believe Noreen Rainier uh, taught uh, remote viewing to FBI cadets at the Academy at Quantico. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, I, I just I make the point yeah. that here is an example of a woman who, although she has been attacked by deniers, actually the law enforcement agencies themselves have come forward to support her. Yeah. Um, I got interested in this, or got involved with it. I went up to the Army War College uh, in the early 80s to um, examine, uh, to give a briefing to the Delta Force uh, at the Army War College in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. And afterwards, the after I got through speaking, uh, because it was a secured room, because it was a secured briefing, the the ma the major the army major who was sort of taking me around uh, came forward and and said with a little confusion and a little accusation in his voice the district attorney of Lancaster County and the chief of police uh, of the state troopers are waiting for you outside <laughs> and I could see he was looking at me what have you done <laughs> but anyway I went out and the um, uh, a district attorney was a man named Mick Rank, Michael Rank, and um, he had with him this state uh, trooper, uh, and they said, a young Amish girl, this is in the Amish community in Lancaster, uh, a young Amish girl has disappeared, 14-year-old girl has disappeared, and 14-year-old Amish girls don't disappear, so we, something has happened to her, and she's been gone for several weeks. And we're, we just don't know what to do. We, we've tried everything we can think of. And can you, can you help us? Mm -hmm. I understand, he didn't know anything about remote viewing, but he said, I understand you do this in archaeology. Is it possible you could do this? To, to, because we think there's a crime here, but we don't know what it is. So I said, yes, we do what we could. And I went back to Los Angeles and, and in the next 48 hours, I got a group of viewers together. Again, I use consensual viewers or, or multiple viewers in the mm -hmm. consensus, Mobius consensus methodology. In other um, words, where the uh, reports of the viewers overlap, you have consensus. Well, what I do is interview independently. <clears throat> I actually have several people do the interviews. Uh, we interview independently multiple viewers. And what we're looking for is uh, basically two things, where they agree and odd, low a priori observations. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I ask you to describe a ship and you describe an anchor to me, well, I mean, you could be right, but ships and anchors, they kind of go together. But if you said to me there's an amethyst chandelier in the captain's cabin, I don't expect that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a low a priori observation. Mm -hmm. That's an actual case, by the way. Um, in any case, the story that they conducted was they said this 14-year-old girl was dead, that her body was to be found uh, near a, a, an abandoned roadhouse up, on, up in the mountains, mm -hmm. uh, that it w had been buried in a shallow grave covered with leaves and twigs and branches, and um, that she had been killed by a man who was a teacher but not a teacher that he uh, had enticed her to go with him. He had then uh, killed, uh, he had uh, uh, put a, a gag in her mouth, put a sock in her mouth. He had um, uh, raped her and then he had struck her. When she struggled, he had struck her with some kind of metal, uh, like a wrench and um, uh, killed her, struck her on the right zygotic arch and that that caused bleeding that caused her to die. And he had put her body in the back of a large black car and he had driven around for some time trying to figure out what to do with the body 
and he'd gotten hungry along the way and stopped at a White Castle and had uh, three hamburgers. That's very specific. And then he had driven up into the mountains uh, and where he had seen the roadhouse and he pulled off behind the roadhouse and he took her body out and he carried it out into the woods and, and buried it. So that's what we sent back. Mm -hmm. And this is very typical. I use this case because they're, this is very typical of how these things go. The, uh, when I sent the data to uh, Mick Rank uh, back in Lancaster, he read it and then he called me up and he, and this is also very typical, and he said, well, I really appreciate the effort that you've made, but, but um, you know, we know where that roadhouse is and we've searched up there. There's no body. We've searched literally uh, elbow to elbow and uh, I'm sorry. And basically, don't call us, we'll call you. Mm. And I thought, well, okay, it's, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that was, we thought, the end of it. About a week later, I get a call from Rank, and uh, he says, I owe you an apology. Uh, a hunter up near that old roadhouse was back in the woods, and he found the body. Mm -hmm. And it was buried in a shallow grave covered with leaves and twigs and branches. So we, and it had, a, 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 she had a gag in her mouth. And so they brought the body in and they did the autopsy and um, the, the uh, pathologist who did the autopsy came out and said, well, she died, uh, she had this gag in her mouth and she must have suffocated in some way. And Rank said to him, was she struck on the side of the head? And he said, oh, well, gee, I didn't really look for that. And, uh, you know, he want, I said, I, I want to go home and have dinner. And Rank said, no, you go back in there and check, because that's the difference between second and first degree murder. And, and so the pathologist went back in, and he came out in a few minutes, and he said to Rank, I really am sorry. I don't know how I missed this, but yes, she must have been struck with something like a wrench, and it caused internal bleeding, and because she had the gag in her mouth, she couldn't spit it out. And I mean, it's a horrible story. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, she not so, not only suffocated, but she sort of gagged on her own blood. And so then they took it very seriously, and they went through every everybody this child knew. I mean, Amish kids lead a much quieter life than, than most American teenagers. And they finally found a janitor who, as it turned out, which nobody had really appreciated, was a martial arts teacher and this girl was taking martial arts instruction. A teacher, but not a teacher. Mm -hmm. So they brought the guy in. And, and he, of course, he denied everything, and they had no evidence uh, about it. He came in with his lawyer, and um, they went through the thing. He denied everything. And at the end, Rank, who was very smart, said to him, Look, I know you murdered this girl. I know that you killed her after you raped her, and I know you put her in the back of your, and he turned out he drove a big black car, I know you put her in the trunk of your car, and I know that you, she, you drove her up to the roadhouse and that you buried her. I only have one question. And the guy said, well, you know, I didn't do any of that, what's the question? He said, how could you possibly have stopped at a White Castle and eaten three hamburgers with a dead body in the trunk? And at that point, the attorney said, Wait, wait, uh, if you'll excuse us a minute, uh, Mr. Egg, I'd mm -hmm. like to talk to my client. And he said to him, um, they must know, they, they must have a witness. Is it true? Did you do mm -hmm. that? And, and the guy still sort of denied it originally, uh, initially, and, and he said, well, did you stop at a White Castle and have those hamburgers? Because that is such a weird sort of unexpected thing that if they have that kind of evidence, they have more evidence. And the guy said, well, yes, I did. And as you and I are sitting here doing this interview, he's in prison. Mm -hmm. So he confessed. Yeah. The, that is a fairly typical kind of remote viewing in criminology. There is a great deal of it. In the state of Florida, for instance, there are even instructions for law enforcement about how to work with uh, a non-local perception performance uh, people and um, uh, the FBI has uh, rules about this 
uh, in a sense, the, the SRI laboratory, for instance, it, they were doing intelligence work, but it's basically the same yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. On a larger scale, yeah, perhaps. A larger scale than in other countries, but mm -hmm. basically it's the same kind of idea. Mm -hmm. I produced for ABC a primetime special called Psychic Detectives, in which we did five cases. The network standards and practices person said to me when we did the, had the initial meeting, I'm never going to approve this show and you're never going to make it. So just take the kill fee. That is a fee they give you if they decide mm -hmm. not to go forward because I'm never going to sign off on this. And I said to her, what would make you sign off on it? And she said, you would have to bring me documentation of every single sentence in the script and I will not accept media. I will only accept uh, sworn testimony in court or uh, testimony by officers of the court or by uh, law enforcement people under oath. Mm -hmm. And you can't get that. And I said, well, let's see if we can try. And we eventually turned over to her, a woman named Susan Futterman, uh, 2,000 pages of documentation. And to give you a sense of how, how specific it got, she said uh, there was a scene where a, a woman goes up to a man and says, have you got a match? And we had to fly a crew down to, down to uh, Louisiana and um, to get them to take testimony as to whether that was what she said. <laughs> in, in any case, the um, these five cases, uh, I say this mm -hmm. to make the point that w if anybody looks at it, that everything in that is very carefully documented. Yeah. And one of the ones I'll just mention very quickly was a case where uh, a, a man named Andre Daigle disappeared and they went to a uh, remote viewer named Rosemary Kerr and in the middle of the remote viewing session she said oh my god you've got to get up right now and go to a particular highway and and they're driving on the highway right now and and by god they called this was in in California they called back to Louisiana and they said get in the car and drive out to this particular part in this highway in Louisiana and look for this particular kind of truck because that's the people. And they got in the car and they went out and, by God, they caught them. Just like that. And they were convicted. Yeah. So you can see extraordinary things. From a researcher's point of view, remote viewing in criminology is not, as, not terribly satisfactory. And the reason is that police have so much work that the kind of careful concept by concept analysis, and I can see this also in the intelligence work that the SRI people did, you don't get in these criminological settings, it's very hard to get the kind of concept by concept mm -hmm. analysis and yeah. evaluation that we could get in the archeological mm -hmm. projects. Yep. So I didn't do a lot of criminology, but as we are sitting here, I guarantee you there are at least two places in the United States at this moment where remote viewers are helping police, usually without any public awareness of it, helping police solve crimes. Or compensation. Typically it's oh, yes, done that's... without compensation. Yeah, oh yes. I mean, this isn't something these people do for, for to make a lot of money. I mean, they do it because they want to see justice done. Mm -hmm. And they volunteer their time to do this. And it's going on mm -hmm. all the time. It's very quiet. It's usually not ever officially acknowledged. But it has been a part of police work for at least a century in, that we can document. I think probably one of the big problems that uh, police departments are faced with is that when a case receives a certain amount of public uh, publicity, notoriety, you get a lot of people who imagine themselves to be psychic yes. and are calling the police and uh, yes. offering tips that, uh, that don't pan out. Yes, I mean, that's true. I mean, the, so the police, you know, how do you know, you know, how do you know which is the peanut butter and which is not when it comes off the fan? So um, it's it's difficult for them mm -hmm. to be able to evaluate it, which is why I was told by uh, another FBI a special agent that he said, you know, what we learn is you cultivate relationships with certain people, 
like Noreen Rainier, mm -hmm. that you know can reliably yeah. produce this data? I you know, myself have a master's degree in criminology, so I took a big interest in this and worked with a, a psychic in California named Kathleen Ray, who oh, yeah. specialized in, in police work. She uh, had in her office badges that were given to her from about 60 or 70 different police departments for the successful cases that yes. she worked on. They don't get credit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really quite selfless if you think about it. They don't yeah. get credit. They don't usually get paid money, or if they do, very little money. Um, they get a lot of scorn and a lot of skepticism. But these are uh, individuals, mm -hmm. and interestingly enough, a majority of them are women yeah. who, who just feel that that they want to see justice done uh, 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 and that bad guys get put mm -hmm. in jail and they're willing to go through all of that and they would develop these relationships with a few police officers or law enforcement yep. people and they work at it and they do it for years. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain personality. Yes, it does. I mean, for instance, uh, some remote viewers that I worked with did not want to do criminological cases yeah. because they did not want to revisit and re-experience a murder. Mm -hmm. Or not Understandably so. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know, Hella Hammond said to me, why in the world would I want to remote view a murder? Yeah. But other people feel because they have a very strong sense of justice about things like this, mm -hmm. that they not only must do it, uh, that not only that they are willing to do it, but that they must do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they are responsible for the solution of a number of crimes which might otherwise have gone unresolved. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of cases in which uh, some of the information provided, uh, well, in one case, led to the uh, arrest and conviction of a police chief for murder. Mm -hmm. Well, as I say, they, they resolve things that cannot be resolved in other ways. Yeah. yeah. So it's... Uh, it's a rather selfless group of people. People, skeptics claim they do it for self-aggrandizement and all that. But my experience has been that these are individuals who are mostly profoundly motivated mm -hmm. by a need to see justice done in horrible events. Well, it seems to me that for police departments and law enforcement agencies that are interested in pursuing this, it's good to have on staff somebody who has some expertise in doing projects of this sort or to be able to work with a uh, serious uh, research organization such as the one you were running. Yes, I mean we we did, we didn't do dozens of them, but we did a number of these. We did mm -hmm. a bomber, we did several murders, yeah. um, all of which we were able to resolve and that would have not yeah. otherwise have gotten resolved, but, but um, from a research point of view, it's not as satisfying as doing the archaeological work because you don't get the meticulous mm -hmm. kind of feedback because the police are so overworked that by the time they solve this one, they're on yeah. to the next one. And, and you know, spending a week going through each concept, was the jacket gray or was it blue? That kind of thing is just, mm -hmm. they don't have the time for it. I was involved personally in a case uh, in California where a, uh, a man was missing. A 70-year-old man wandered away from his campsite and was never located up in Calaveras County in California where they have the famous frog jumping right. contest I think Mark Twain wrote about. And uh, they had searchers looking for that man for six months without success uh, when his wife finally called Kathleen Ray at her office hundreds of miles away in, uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, she sat down and within a few minutes gave them a description and uh, I talked to the sheriff Claude Ballard at the time he said when he got that description he knew exactly where to go she described how the man had wandered off the trail had a stroke had uh, fallen into some bushes where he, his body had lain for six months and she said no animals had gotten to it the body would still be intact and uh, they just took that description well, uh, that she gave and went right to the location, mm -hmm. found the body instantly. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, a number in a number of these cases, the law enforcement people have been willing to go into court. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Mick Rank, for instance, in this case, little Amish girl case that I described, was willing. Nova made a program in which they uh, recounted this case, and he was willing to go on camera. Mm-hmm. Um, most I, of the time, they don't want to do that. Yeah, in the opening to the what, opening to the Infinite book, I did a whole chapter on on the use of remote viewing in criminology, yeah. and I got I was astonished really. Mm-hmm. I, I got district attorneys, state police captains, uh, attorneys, uh, uh, local you know local police mm-hmm. who were willing to go on record and say yes, this was how we were able to solve this. So. Uh, there's no question uh, w- when you look at the remote viewing criminology work and you and you look at it also in the context of the laboratory work and the archaeological work and things like that uh, there's no question that this is a useful thing and and I went I had a friend who was a deputy chief of police in Los Angeles and and I went to him and said at one point you know we could set up a training program um, and we uh, uh, I just did a, a little prototype of it because the police, the thing that they were particularly interested in, which I would never have thought of, was they wanted to know when they went to domestic violence, mm-hmm. was there someone with a gun behind the door? Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes the police get shot in those yes, circumstances. Yes, because they go in and some guy is drunk or mm-hmm. crazed and and they get shot mm-hmm. coming into the door. So yeah. w- the, that was the th- main thing they asked me. Yeah. Would it be possible to remote view uh, the, the site of a domestic violence call so that we know whether a gun is present at the scene? Mm-hmm. It works, and um, and it's being used. I think it ought to be formalized myself. Mm-hmm. In a, and it ought to become part of a course. Well, I hope so. I hope that day comes, and I hope that perhaps this video will help make it happen a little sooner. May that be true. Stephen Schwartz, once again, thank you so much for sharing your depth of experience with yeah, me. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Mm-hmm.